يسعدني ان انا طبعا اقدم هو الدكتور شريف قدمها لكن بونبونايه المؤتمرات كلها الدكتوره رشا طريف وطبعا هي هتكلمنا عن الهايبوثايروديز اتفضلي دكتور ولاء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بشكر حضرتك على التقديم الجميل يعني سعيده جدا بوجودي مع حضراتكم بشكر دكتور شريف دكتوره ولاء دكتور احمد جلال على دعوتي سعيده وتشرفت جدا بوجودي مع حضراتكم النهارده والحقيقه يعني ما شاء الله الحضور جميل احنا بدري فعلا بس ما شاء الله يعني القاعه على اخرها هتكلم الحقيقه عن توبيك مش بس بيهمنا احنا كبيدياتريك اندوكرينولوجيست لكن كمان بيهم الجنرال بيدياتريشنز كلنا بنقابل حالات في العياده جاي لنا الثيرويد فانكشنز مش وحشه قوي بس برضو مش نورمال اللي هي في مرحله السب كلينيكال هايبوثايرويديزم طيب امتى نعالجهم وامتى ما نعالجهمش وامتى نعمل لهم ريفيرال اي هوب ان انا اقدر تو ادريس ذس توبيك النهارده ان شاء الله از يو نو سب كلينيكال هايبوثايرويديزم از ديفايند از elevated TSH with normal T4. And it's usually asymptomatic, so it is a biochemical diagnosis. When facing a child with subclinical hypothyroidism, the frequently asked questions by the parents and even in the mind of the doctor are, is it transient and will resolve? Could it progress to overt hypothyroidism to treat or not to treat? And this is the most difficult question. And finally, is it a lifelong treatment or not? Now, looking at the clinical course of subclinical hypothyroidism in children, about half of the cases continue as subclinical hypothyroidism. 40% revert to you thyroidism and only 10% develop overt hypothyroidism. So the majority will either resolve or continue in the subclinical phase. And the course of subclinical hypo differs according to etiology. You can see on the box on the right side that Hashimoto thyroiditis is the most common cause of acquired hypothyroidism in children. Also, there's another long list of causes and sometimes it's idiopathic. Please remember that idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism is usually self-limiting, while subclinical hypo progresses to overt hypothyroidism if it's part of Hashimoto thyroiditis or associating other autoimmune disease or chromosomal aberration. And please remember to exclude drug intake in any child or adolescent with subclinical hypothyroidism because you can see in the box on the left side a very long list of drugs. On top of the list is antithyroid drugs, amiodarone, anti-epileptics, and other drugs that could predispose to subclinical hypothyroidism. Another point is that long-standing subclinical hypothyroidism could predispose to metabolic syndrome in the form of insulin resistance, obesity, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. And mechanism here is either dyslipidemia, hypercoagulopathy, inflammation, hypertension, endothelial dysfunction, high homocysteine and lipoprotein A, ending by cardiovascular sequelae if neglected for a long time. And this is a quite recent article published in 2019, evaluating cardiovascular risk in those with subclinical hypothyroidism. And the clear conclusion was that there is a diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle in those children. Another point is that obesity aggravates the situation more. Obesity could lead to subclinical hypothyroidism and metabolic syndrome. And subclinical hypothyroidism by itself could lead to metabolic syndrome and the vicious circle goes on. So how does obesity lead to subclinical hypo? Increased fat mass increases the serum leptin and the TSH and increase in the fat free mass increases the T4 disposal, which lowers the T4 leading to a rise in the TSH 
and this causes the vicious circle to go on. In addition, increase in the free fatty acids and the chronic inflammatory state with obesity leads to insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, which aggravates subclinical hypothyroidism and the vicious circle goes on. An article published in 2019 in Endocrine Journal assessed the features of metabolic syndrome in those with subclinical hypothyroidism. And the most important risk factors here were found to be abdominal obesity and hypertension in those children. Also, there was a correlation between the degree of rise in the TSH level and the lipid profile. The higher the TSH, the more the LDL and the total cholesterol, as you see here. Also, there is a correlation between subclinical hypothyroidism being a risk factor for NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And in this article, thyroid dysfunction was incriminated to play a role in the pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And looking closely at the mechanism, you can see that there is increase in FGF1 and leptin in addition to low lipoprotein lipase activity, increasing the total cholesterol triglycerides leading to hepatic insulin resistance. Now, coming to the most difficult question, to treat or not to treat a child with subclinical hypothyroidism. In other words, which way shall we go? Now, let me tell you, there is no clear consensus in children till now. And let me take you to the story of this eight-year-old boy who was accidentally discovered with subclinical hypothyroidism. His BMI and height is normal, negative family history, he is asymptomatic, there is no goiter, the TSH is highish, 7.8, the T4 is normal, the antibodies are negative, and the ultrasound is normal. Would you like to treat or wait? Who would like to treat this child? Can you raise your hand? Only one? Okay. So we do not need to treat this child because TSH did not exceed 10. We treat if the TSH is above 10 or if antibodies are positive. The child is not short. He doesn't have goiter, no symptoms. So we did not treat this child. Now, the boy came six months later, and look at the TSH. The TSH jumped to 12.2, thyroid antibodies are still negative, and the ultrasound is normal. Let me ask you at this point, would you like to treat? Who would like? Yes, thank you very much. We have to treat. When the TSH exceeds 10, even if the child is not symptomatic, we have to treat. What about this 10-year-old boy whose BMI is in the high normal? He's not obese, but he's overweight. His height is in the low normal. His maternal aunt has got Graves' disease. There is goiter grade 2. TSH is high, 8.9, but did not exceed 10. Antibodies are positive. Ultrasound revealed goiter with heterogeneous echo texture. Would you like to treat or wait? Who would treat? Yes. Okay. Most of the audience would like to treat. In fact, this case is controversial, but for me, I would like to treat because there are a lot of risk factors. There is a positive family history. There is goiter. Antibodies are positive. There are pathological findings in the ultrasound. So it's wise to treat because there are a lot of risk factors. What about this seven-year-old obese girl? She's obese, but she's very tall. She's not short like the previous case. There is no goiter, T4 is normal, TSH is highish, antibodies are negative and ultrasound is normal. Who would like to treat this girl? Anyone would like to treat this obese? Okay, again, this girl is very tall, she's not short, meaning that no affection of the growth. She is obese, TSH is highish and the antibodies and ultrasound are normal. In such a case, what we need is to advise weight loss. If obese and tall, just advise weight loss and healthy lifestyle. And when we did this, TSH went down without treatment. What about this 13 and a half year old girl with 45X Turner syndrome? 
which is short with delayed puberty, TSH is 5.5, high normal, and the T4 is normal, antibodies are negative. The girl has got celiac disease positive, confirmed by biopsy, ultrasound, horseshoe kidney, and she has hypergonadotropic hypogonadism with delayed bone age. She started growth hormone and sex steroid, and then she came for follow-up. Look what happened to the TSH. The T4 went down, the TSH went up, so she has subclinical hypo. The antibodies became positive. It was negative at the beginning. And the bone age is delayed more and more, three years. Would you like to treat? Thank you very much. Everyone would like to treat. Yes. Turner by itself, as we said, is a risk factor because hypothyroidism in chromosomal aberrations and syndrome is usually permanent. So we have to treat. Antibodies are positive. TSH is rising. The bone age is becoming more delayed. So we have to treat. And let me share with you the guidelines frontier in endocrinology 2019. And what was clearly written is that treatment of subclinical hypo is controversial in children. And when the question was raised, when to treat a child with subclinical hypothyroidism, the answer was, if there is a high risk of progression to overt hypothyroidism. And here they categorize the groups into either low risk or high risk. The low risk is idiopathic, if the TSH is less than 10, negative antibodies, no goiter, no other autoimmune disease, no chromosomal aberration or post-pubertal, and of course, in males. The high risk group includes hypothyroidism related subclinical hypo when there is a thyroid pathology. If the TSH is above 10, you have to treat positive and rising antibodies, Turner, Down, syndromes, any other syndromes, celiac disease, prepubertal at diagnosis, and of course, female sex is a risk factor. Now, the baseline TSH is the most powerful predictor for progression of subclinical hypo, and it is recommended to start thyroxine if the TSH is more than 10, whatever the etiology, and this is the only solid information. Increased risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality if the TSH is above 10, and there is the highish value from 5 to 10, which is the gray zone. What about the etiology? Idiopathic subclinical hypo is usually self-limiting. And if there is a thyroid pathology seen by ultrasound, more frequently it will worsen and go to overt hypothyroidism, especially if associated with autoimmune disease or chromosomal aberration. What about the American Thyroid Association recommendation for treating children with subclinical hypo? Again, the same difficult question, to treat or not to treat, and the same answer. It's controversial in children. But the ATA recommendation put clear guidelines. It's better to treat if the TSH is above 10, symptomatic, like short stature or any symptoms, or if there is high risk of progression, like the boxes that I showed you. And they clearly mentioned, do not treat if the TSH is from five to 10, especially if the antibodies are negative, idiopathic, no goiter, asymptomatic, and no thyroid pathology by ultrasound. And the gray zone, consider treatment if the TSH is two times the normal or above eight, progressive rise in the TSH, positive antibodies, goiter, short stature, cardiovascular risk factors, and thyroid pathology by ultrasound. So this is the most challenging part, the gray zone. And that's why we need to balance the decision and treat on individual basis in such cases. And here you can see the work of, of subclinical hypo in children, free T4, TSH, antibodies, ultrasound, look at the symptoms, family history, exclude medications, obesity, thyroid dysgenesis, adrenal and syndromic and renal failure. What about this 10-year-old girl who came with cystic swelling in the neck? It moves on swallowing and protrusion of the tongue with no pain and discharge. There is no lymphadenopathy and she does not have any symptoms of hypothyroidism. Now look at the TSH, 11. 
the T4 is 0.9, the antibodies are negative. We did an ultrasound. We found a multi-septated cystic lesion. We did not find thyroid gland, so it's not visualized in the fossa. So when we do not see the thyroid gland by ultrasound, we have to do a thyroid scan. We found ectopic thyroid gland near the hyoid and inside a thyroglossal cyst. And this was confirmed by CT scan. So the diagnosis here is ectopic thyroid in a thyroglossal cyst and infrahyoid. What would you like to do for this girl? First of all, shall we give thyroxine or not? Yes, definitely, because the TSH is above 10. And we have to remove the thyroglossal cyst because it's liable to malignancy. In infants, the situation is even more critical. This is an eight-day-old neonate who was completely normal, came with a TSH of 14 in the first week of life, and the ultrasound is normal. Would you like to treat this baby? Yes or no? No. Thank you very much. The baby is asymptomatic. And in neonate, we have to wait until the TSH is above 20. So we will wait. And this is the European Society for Pediatric Endocrinology guidelines on how to deal with infants with hypothyroidism. If the TSH is above 40, you have to treat and do imaging. If less than 40, take a venous blood sample. If the T4 is below the normal or TSH above 20, you have to treat. And if you cannot see thyroid gland by ultrasound, you can just do a thyroid scan. If the TSH is from 6 to 20, repeat after two weeks. Don't treat. Repeat after two weeks and do an ultrasound as well. Now, the neonate came to me after two weeks with a TSH of 22. Would you like to treat? Who would like to treat? Yes, thank you very much. Of course, we have to treat because the TSH is above 20. So decision of treatment is controversial because this is a gray zone in the neonate. In infants with mild subclinical hypo, 72% resolve spontaneously. So please don't treat except when the TSH is above 20. And the indications of treatment, if it persists above 10 for more than a month, symptoms or if there is a definite pathology by ultrasound like ectopia, because there are concerns about the neurodevelopment and the growth. Now, let me end by this 14-year-old girl with chronic kidney disease since four years. Her creatinine is high. She's asymptomatic. She has goiter grade two. TSH is highish. And the T4 is normal. The ultrasound showed enlarged thyroid without any def definite pathology. Now, this is a case of subclinical hypothyroidism associating chronic kidney disease. Now, let me ask the same difficult question. Would you like to treat this girl? Who would like to treat? Okay. Some would treat and others would not treat. But in most of the cases, it is not advisable to treat in chronic kidney disease, except if the TSH exceeds 10 as well, because this is a compensatory mechanism in patients with chronic renal disease, the rise in the TSH. So attempts of unnecessary thyroid hormone replacement increases the muscle catabolism, leading to negative nitrogen balance. So this is God's compensatory mechanism in those children. So there is no need to treat subclinical hypothyroidism in patients with chronic kidney disease, except if the TSH is above 10. And if you decide to start, start with a very small dose of thyroxine and increase gradually. And monitor for angina and cardiac arrhythmia. And this is a nice article published in JCEM, again, confirming the cutoff do not treat chronic kidney disease and subclinical hypo, except when the TSH is above 10. Now, my final conclusions are, subclinical hypothyroidism is less common in children than adults. Generally speaking, most of pediatric subclinical hypothyroid cases resolve spontaneously, about 40%, which is a very good percentage. The decision of treatment of subclinical hypo in children is highly controversial. Even the big societies and guidelines did not put a clear cutoff. 
Children with TSH above 10 must be treated, whatever the cause, even if idiopathic. Children with TSH from five to 10 are treated on individual basis based on the risk factors that we have discussed. Children with idiopathic subclinical hypo are usually self-limiting. Don't treat idiopathic except if the TSH is above 10. Children with hypothyroidism related subclinical hypo require treatment and follow-up. If you have pathology by ultrasound, children with pathology require good follow-up because mostly they will progress to overt hypo. Obesity related subclinical hypo needs follow-up and weight loss. Don't treat subclinical hypo in obese tall children. What we need is to advise healthy lifestyle and weight loss, and they will do nicely and it will resolve. Infants with borderline TSH level from 6 to 20 need close follow-up. Again, don't treat neonates except if the TSH is above 20. And finally, this is a quote that I liked a lot. Sometimes you make the right decision, and sometimes you make the decision right. And this is what we need to do when dealing with those children and this critical part of pediatric endocrinology. So try to make the decision right in order to hit the target. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and you touched a very, يعني, uh, very important topic. And the واحد بيقابل حالات كتير جدا جاية من عن general pediatricians ابتدوا العلاج على خمسة وعلى ستة وابتدوا العلاج فعلا. So you touch it very uh, important topics so very common بصراحة كتير جدا جدا جدا. فإحنا بنشكرك دايما على التوكس الهيلة بتاعتك. مرسيل حضرتك. وزي ما قال الدكتور محمد كده بمبوناية بتاعت الاندوكراين. ربنا يغلي حضرتك. شكرا. الحقيقة أنا بحب أشكر طبعا الدكتور أستاذ الدكتور الشريف. وأستاذ الدكتورة ولاء على الدعوة الكريمة وعلى المؤتمر الناجح اللي هو دايما بصراحة يعني من أول مؤتمر اللي فات وإحنا شايفين دايما إيه